Sonic the Hedgehog has always been about speed. In 1991, Sega created Sonic to usurp Nintendo's own Titan Mario in the video game wars. Sonic's technological innovations and cool design took the market by storm and solidified him as a gaming icon. His speedy style is precisely why he exists today. In a typical Sonic game, the player controls our titular Sonic the Hedgehog. The goal is to navigate him through each of the game's stages, defeating robot enemies and avoiding obstacles while racing to get the fastest time possible. Today, we'll take a look at a particularly speedy game in the series, 2008's Sonic Unleashed, known as Sonic World Adventure in Japan. Here we go! We will examine not only how Sonic Unleashed uses speed to provide an exciting modern pleasure for players, but also how this speed alters the player's perception of the game's fictional cultures and locations. Sonic's goal in the plot of Sonic Unleashed is to literally put the world back together after it's broken apart by the maniacal Dr. Eggman. This journey leads Sonic across an Earth-like planet, exploring eight locales inspired by real-world nations. Apotos is based on Greece, Shamar is based on the Middle East, etc. Sonic's visits to these countries are split into smaller areas. Here we'll discuss the hub worlds and the day stages. The hub worlds are set in cities or villages, limiting Sonic to visit with the locals and search for collectible secrets. Day stages are action-packed episodes where Sonic unleashes his full speed, and the player must run him to a goal as fast as possible. What makes these areas interesting is the perspectives they use to construct the story world. In French scholar Michel Desartaux's 1984 essay, Walking in the City, he distinguishes two perspectives with which one beholds the city. The first perspective is that of the walker, the city's ordinary practitioner. They utilize the streets, engaged in constant motion, populating and defining the paths of the city. Think a pedestrian on a sidewalk. The second perspective is the voyeur, an elevated watcher of the city. They have a panoramic view that lets them witness the entire city at once, missing out on finer details, but able to take in the entire makeup. Think of a resident of a high-rise apartment. A clear line can be drawn between the perspective of the walker and the hub worlds of Sonic Unleashed. Here, Sonic is a pedestrian who walks amongst the city's inhabitants. The meticulously designed towns are full of people and architecture that convey the game's fictitious cultures. Sonic's max speed is limited, and he cannot harm citizens. His main method of interaction is dialogue, having casual conversations with passerby or purchasing souvenirs from markets. In the hub worlds, the player is immersed in culture as a walker. The walker's perspective is also present in the day stages. While these stages are mostly devoid of passerby, nothing stops the player from slowing Sonic down and taking the course at their own pace. In fact, based on the amount of detail in some of these areas, it appears the game intends for players to take a leisurely stroll once in a while. This is best shown in Apotos. The details on signs, the placement of chairs and tables, this staircase leading to a home, this man cheering Sonic on from a rooftop, this pelican who directs Sonic towards the goal. The entire game can theoretically be played this way, but it results in low rankings after each stage, so speed is really encouraged. Even so, bursting through the day stages at breakneck speed does maintain some of the walker perspective. For example, the player's camera rarely zooms out far enough to get a complete bird's-eye voyeur view of the location. Sonic continues to interact with the world up close and on foot, engaged in constant motion as the player navigates the stage's path. An especially interesting example is in Shamar, where the player actually has to contend with pedestrian foot traffic. Even though running into them doesn't actually hurt anyone and it just kind of slows Sonic down and annoys the player. Despite all this use of the walker perspective, it can't be ignored that the element of speed does change the player's perception of the world into something that's more than a walker. Like the voyeur, speed approaches the same empowerment and liberation, but it does it in a different way. Here, Enda Duffy's work in the speed handbook will be referenced extensively. Let's return to 1991 for a second, to the genesis of Sonic the Hedgehog. Why was speed so crucial to Sonic's success? Why was the idea of going fast so popular? Well, Duffy posits that there are two modern ways to how we understand speed, and those might help us understand a little bit better what was so appealing about Sonic the Hedgehog. The first way to understand speed is through the modern obsession with efficiency. This idea of beating the clock, being on time for schedules, etc. This factor of speed is onerous, stressful, annoying, and it is clearly not why Sonic became popular. In fact, most Sonic game timers count upwards to track in game time, rather than ticking downwards to time out, like in Mario. This shows that there was a conscious decision to remove this kind of time stress. 
Then there's Duffy's second way of understanding speed, that speed transforms our surroundings into something novel and exciting. Driving an automobile, for example, has unprecedented demands on the senses. At the wheel of a vehicle, people are expected to demonstrate concentration and instantaneousness that is rarely demanded of them anywhere else. They must also engage with and overcome fear, the fear of losing control or causing an accident, which is a responsibility particular to driving. This stress is eventually overpowered by the primal thrill of velocity, and eventually drivers become numb to these stresses. For Sonic, these exciting factors all still apply, but without any of the threat of physical danger, which is kind of perfect. Thus, we see the empowering effects of the day stages in Sonic Unleashed. However, this level of speed also has an obscuring effect. Sonic passes many sights in each day stage, but it all whips behind a blur that's difficult to consciously appreciate. As described by Ernst Mach, the boundaries between things are disappearing, the subject and the world are no longer separate, and time seems to stand still. Sonic's sheer speed forces the player to skim over the intricate details of each location, and it all blurs together, also absorbing Sonic into the landscape to make him part of the spectacle too. This speed-tainted perspective paradoxically invokes both the involved perspective of the walker and the removed perspective of the voyeur. Duffy describes the relationship as follows. These two notions of intense closeness and of ethereal possible virtuality are present at once as clashing opposed elements of the viewer's experience of this novel gaze. The term he often uses for this composite perspective is speed gaze. This is also where Henry Bergson's work on space comes in. Bergson suggests that space ought not be thought of as an abstract pre-existing plane where movement takes place, a land that needs to be mapped out. He instead posits that movement precedes space, that it is dictated by actions, not positions. This phenomenological notion of space is remarkably similar to how environments are actually constructed in video games like Sonic Unleashed, where the world is loaded behind the scenes to meet the player character's movements and not vice versa. This is merely a technique used to save memory and processing power, but the parallel is notable. What sets Sonic Unleashed apart from other racing games, like Forza Horizon, which also take the player on a speedy tour of an exotic locale, is Sonic himself. Here, the player takes control of a character, not a faceless vehicle. Sonic has no homeland, he's more like a citizen of the planet than of any specific country, and with no language barriers in the hub areas, he acts as the player's tour guide, their camera into these digital landscapes. Not to mention, he truly embodies the spirit of the walker, constantly in motion and weaving new stories wherever he goes. And by taking Sonic along different routes in each stage, the player is presented with different perspectives of the same locale. For example, in Adabat, I always took this road that generated platforms for Sonic to cross. But after some exploration, I discovered an alternate road that instead generated rails by the cliffside. Each gives a slightly different outlook leading to the same end goal. As Duffy wrote, with all this flashing before them, the viewer has the task of editing, choosing what is important, ignoring the rest, and restitching scenes into a narrative that will, in turn, make sense of the confusing mass of scenes that follow at every succeeding moment. This all ties back to Deserteau. In Walking in the City, he describes a second poetic geography, meaning a path or routine articulated by walkers as they navigate a city. Walkers create this on top of the geography of the literal, forbidden, or permitted meaning. They insinuate other routes into the functionals and historical order of movement. Walking follows them. I fill this great empty space with a beautiful name. So, the route one takes to work, the businesses one visits, they all map out a story in the city. Much in the same way, Sonic and the player take these stages, which have been planned by game developers like architects, and write their own second poetic geographies on top of them. Of course, this does beg the question of possible colonialist implications, like what it means to make the player craft their own interpretations of exotic lands at reckless speeds. But that topic lies outside the scope of this essay and would require further research to properly address. Thus, Sonic's movement through the day stages is what constructs the game's story world and the player's experiences with them. By moving at high speeds, the player generates the planet itself. This meta-interpretation matches the main theme of Sonic Unleashed, seeing what the world has to offer. By using the perspective of the walker so extensively, the game puts the player among the people and the cities of the planet. Using high speed to induce a speed gaze, the game allows the player to craft their very own experiences with the game's locations and cultures. This results in a unique examination of how cultures are constructed through our encounters with them, and what it means to experience the world.